and once you get there, then you can start implanting. It takes you seven days also because at, during that period of time you're developing, you're specializing, you're forming actually an outer coat that is used to get into the uterine line. Before that time you don't have that developed. You're growing, you're specializing and so on. It's like at a certain period of time, now you finally have achieved this level of development. It's almost like saying, well, you can't vote until you're 18 years of age. Well, you can't implant until you're seven days old. Next slide. <laughs> there have been people, though, who have tried to redefine the biology. They're not changing the biology. They're just trying to change the definition of what we would recognize. And so here was an example where they were trying to change the definition of embryo. But it was politically motivated. It had no basis in biology. We've seen similar types of attempts to change the definition of when conception is at implantation instead of fertilization, or when pregnancy might start. Doesn't change the biology, no matter how you might want to change how you view that definition. So again, here is where you and I all started, at the single-celled embryo. Next slide. We divide into two cells, and then four, and eight, and 16, and finally at seven days, this is how we looked. This is how we all looked, at seven days along in our life. Next slide. Uh, the lining of the womb, actually, and the implantation is also not really special in terms of development. There are now some scientists who have decided that they can grow a human embryo in the laboratory without having a womb and actually grow it in the laboratory dish beyond that time of implantation. As far as I mentioned being a single cell, that zygote, that single cell organism is special. If you were to take an average cell though, and this slide shows that from HeLa cells, which are a human carcinoma type cell, you put that one cell in the laboratory dish, it won't grow and develop and specialize. You'll just get more and more HeLa cells. Or if you took a normal human cell, and these are actually some of my adult stem cells from blood, so you put one of my cells in there, you just get more of my cells. You might get some specialization, you might actually get some of them to form neurons and so on, but you're not going to get a new life you don't get an embryo by just growing a single normal cell compared to that special cell that is a new individual. So again, these Carnegie stages, you start up here in the upper left, and then we grow, we develop over time until in the lower right at Carnegie stage 23, roughly about eight weeks, that's the way you look. You start to look more like we think we look now. A little farther along, at 18 and 20 weeks, we're much more recognizable in terms of how we look now. I use these time points also because uh, science, and again objective science, has shown that you can feel pain in the womb at this period of time. It looks like you can feel pain earlier than that, but definitely by 18 to 20 weeks post-fertilization. The science is very clear that you can perceive pain at that point in time. It's also kind of a marker for the way the technology is now in terms of can you survive outside of the womb. We've been told time and again that well you have to be 24 or 28 weeks and so we'll allow abortion before that time. Well, medicine improves, time goes on, you continue to develop and at 20 weeks Micah Pickering was born. There he is on the left soon after birth, and over on the right, a uh, very healthy three-year-old climbing the tree. But he was viable in terms of surviving outside of the womb much earlier than we would have thought beforehand. But he was still that same individual, developing, continuing to grow up to that point. They're doing fetal surgeries now at this point in time. This, probably recognize this little picture of Samuel Armas reaching outside of the womb, grabbing the surgeon's finger. Samuel was operated on at about 20 weeks in the womb. Surgery for spina bifida in this case. There are now thousands of these fetal surgeries going on in the U.S. alone. 
A lot of medical centers are performing them. Uh, actually, Charlotte Lozier Institute, some of our scholars have a paper that will be published after the first of the year detailing a number of these various fetal surgeries that are going on now. Next slide. And the anesthesiologists recognize that you can feel pain at that point in time. They give not just mom, but also the little baby in the womb anesthesia and pain medication at this time because, as the one quote says, the fetus is now a patient. Again, uh, outside of the womb, still continuing to grow and develop. For these very preterm babies, there's a group in Philadelphia that have developed this bio bag to try and put babies back in. Here they're practicing on a lamb to try and just give them a little more time in a nurturing environment so they can grow and develop. So on the left, they had put this lamb in at a very, very preterm age gave her another four weeks to develop her little lungs and so on so that she had a better chance of survival outside of this particular environment. And I want to mention, uh, as Jeannie did, the stem cell debate. So this is kind of what we heard for a number of years, that you either let patients die or you kill embryos and you're going to cure, as one senator told me, all known maladies using embryonic stem cells. Now, it might have been a little bit of a stretch, but it turns out you don't have to destroy that young human life, that embryo, to actually heal. Again, here is a young human being. In most cases, they're looking at only five to seven days again after fertilization. But what we find is that these individuals don't need to be destroyed for healing. And just to reemphasize that point, if this is the same individual uh, from a 2001 House hearing, Lucinda Borden had given her testimony at the hearing in the House, and at the end of it held up this picture of these embryos under the microscope. And then John stood up with Luke and Mark in his arms, just a few months older than the original picture. Same individuals, just later time in their development as human beings. There are alternatives. One, uh, Dr. Yamanaka, developed what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. He won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for that, where you can take just an average cell like a skin cell and change it, reprogram it, so it looks and acts like an embryonic stem cell, but there are no embryos. It's a life-affirming rather than a life-destroying way to get that same kind of cell. And then Dr. Yamanaka was asked, why did you even come up with this? He said, well, I went to a friend's lab, I looked through the microscope at this human embryo, and quotes, when I saw the embryo, I suddenly realized there was such a small difference between it and my daughter's. And I thought, we can't keep destroying embryos for research. There must be another way. And he came up with the iPS cells. The other type of stem cell, the one that's the gold standard for patients, are adult stem cells. You've probably all heard or even know people who've had bone marrow transplants. Those are adult stem cells. We now know you can get adult stem cells from lots of different sources. Umbilical cord blood, uh, the brain, the liver, and my favorite, liposuction fat, because I can be a donor. <laughs> but these cells don't have to destroy the donor to get them, and they actually work to treat patients. By the end of 2012, there were one million patients who had been treated with adult stem cells. We're pretty close to two million at this point in time. And for lots of different conditions, just to give you a couple really quick, sickle cell anemia. This is now, according to the medical literature, considered the only curative therapy for sickle cell disease. It's adult stem cells, though. It's life-affirming work. And another example, stroke. A recent uh, study that's now moved on into further studies at multiple sites around the country treating patients who had had severe stroke damage and rehabilitating their lives again with life-affirming adult stem cells. And one more, back to treating these babies in the womb. This little baby was treated with mom's adult stem cells at about 20 weeks post-fertilization, at the same time where we saw Micah was born and some of these other little babies inside the womb, treated for a severe genetic condition called thalassemia. The little baby's fine, the adult stem cells have successfully treated her, and we can move on now without destroying any lives. 
we put together a little website called stemcellresearchfacts.org where you can see more of these examples. But I want to bring you back to the point that you don't have to destroy any human lives to get these healing, life-saving cells, the adult stem cells. Thank you.